Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So this morning, uh, we're going to continue. We started off a, a mini-series last week, and we said how to be led by the Spirit of God, how to be led by the Word of God. So I, I do want to say something before we start. I, I want to say I'm, uh, I'm not going to talk about happiness today. So some of us, our happiness is short-lived. Uh, I know I'm not here to preach you happy. Hello. I'm not here to preach you happy. I'm here to bring the truth. Is it okay? So today we're going to say something. Maybe you're not, uh, you're not uh, uh, happy that I say it. I'm not here to bring you happiness. God is not even there to bring you happiness. Happiness is short-lived. Joy. Joy is what we're after. Joy is in the morning. And not happiness. Joy comes in the morning. There might be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. Because there's a great thing. You're not after happiness. Happiness comes and goes. Happiness is like getting a new iPhone. No, just hear me out. Or the new phone. The next thing that's making you happy. Let's leave the iPhone out. The next thing that bring, makes you happy. God says, I'm not about superficial, artificial happiness. I'm here to bring you joy. Joy is from the inside out. That's why it's one of the spirit, uh, uh, fruit of the Spirit. Joy. Joy is when the Spirit... When the, the Spirit of God comes upon you, or the Spirit of God um, is inside of you, joy and not happiness. Happiness is, I guess, called three plus two. But joy comes, oh, oh, that's why he said that. Hello. Happiness is you angry at your, of your happiness. They stole my happiness. But joy is when you see the outcome, God says, sowing and reaping. Just for, everybody gave, so you don't have to worry, I'm not after your money now. So, uh, 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 sowing and reaping. Oh, I'm, uh, uh, I was so happy that, that I had all this money. God says, okay, give it. Oh, God, I don't want to give it. Happiness is short-lived. But joy is the moment I opened my hand and God started to bless me because that's what he wanted from me. Now I walk in joy. Happiness is the next big thing. God is not the big, near, next big, big thing. He showed himself through all the ages. He is the one that brings joy. What I love about that scripture in, in Psalms is that joy, uh, pain is in the night. There's a time frame for your pain. But joy comes in the morning. <laughs> joy comes in the morning. It's a time that you will have tears, but there will also be a time when joy is your portion. Amen. So today, I want you to look at your neighbor and say, He's not here to bring me happiness. Look at your neighbor and say, he's not here to bring you happiness. You don't believe me? He's just here, just wait. <laughs> I, I, I said, I'm going to be straight, I'm going to be honest. But I think some of us need to hear it. Some of us need to take this word and say, God, I've missed it. So this morning, I want to be as straight as possible, as honest as possible. Everybody okay with it? Like I said, maybe some of you will not be happy when you go out, but you will have joy at the end. Hello, have a To be led by the Spirit of God. For as many are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So this is our scripture for the, for the past two weeks, and I think for the next week as well. This is going to be our scripture. For as many are led by the Spirit of God, how can you become a son or a daughter of God? You need to be led by the Spirit of God. You need to be led, and led means the following, God will show you your next step. God will show you what does the next step look like. To be led by the Spirit of God, you need to be connected with the Spirit of God. Okay? For he says, for ye have not received the spirit of bondage, something that keeps you in bondage, something that keeps you, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do next. Uh, no, no, no. God says, you have not received the spirit of bondage, but the spirit of adoption, a spirit of relationship, a spirit of God that says, can I just say something? Um, in 2 Corinthians 3, I think it's 15, 16, 17, and 18, it says, where the Spirit of God is, there's freedom. Where the Spirit of God is, there is freedom. So he says, you did not receive a spirit of bondage. What is keeping you from receiving the fullness of God? What is keeping you in bondage? What is keeping you at the place where you say, I don't know what my next step is? What is keeping you in the same cycle of your life every single year and every single six, six months, every relationship? What is keeping you in bondage? 
He says, you did not receive a spirit of bondage. So spirit is not, uh, uh, bondage is not just a thing, it's a spirit. A spirit that keeps you in bondage. Like I said, I'm not going to preach you happy, I'm going to preach you the truth today. He says, you did not receive a spirit of bondage. And the spirit of freedom is also a spirit. So you need to be led by the spirit of freedom, not the spirit of bondage. Hello. Don't worry, we're going to get to it. Okay. Everybody awake? Just wait. Everybody okay? Well, okay. If you have not received the spirit of bondage, again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, which calls out, Abba, Father. And I know some of us call him Abba, some of us call him, here's the thing. The spirit of adoption is a spirit that makes you one with God. It means the moment you accept God as your Lord and your Savior, Jesus Christ, the moment the, he says, I am the word of God, the moment you invite the word of God to be part of your life, it means that Jesus is working on behalf of you. It means that the spirit of God with the word of God comes and it brings an outcome to you. Some of us need to get the word of God in our mouths because we don't know. The first thing is, meditate on the word of God. How many scriptures do you know? Oh, Andre, you know, I don't know the scriptures. Do you know a scripture? Do you know something? I remember when I just got saved, the, the scriptures that really spoke to my heart was, uh, was uh, Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts and the plans I think towards you, says God. And when I move on to Christ, and when I move on to, 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 to be a bit more mature in Christ, because that's our goal, and maturity, just write it down somewhere, take out your phone somewhere, take out your notepad. Maturity in Christ is not about gray hair. Some of us don't have gray hair anymore, we've got boldness now. Some of our men, we know, God is moving every man to boldness. If you don't believe me, just wait. <laughs> God will give you boldness, okay? <laughs> Bold as a lion. I don't understand it. Bold as a lion. Um, yeah, that's one of the things of the Spirit. Of I don't understand. But this is the thing. So I want to tell you that maturity in Christ is not to do about how many years or how old you are. It's about how much God can trust you with. Can God trust you with finances? Can God trust you with your family? Can God trust you with your husband or your wife? Can God trust you? And it's, but, but, but that doesn't sound nice. No, no, no. I want to I ask you. Maturity in Christ, because he says, for those who are, um, uh, you did not receive a spirit of adoption of, uh, from a, a, um, a bondage, but a spirit of adoption that calls out our Father. But just before that, he says, those who are led by the Spirit of God, they who can be called sons and daughters of God. The word the, uh, son of God is a mature son of God. To be mature in Christ. That means the moment you are mature in Christ, God can trust you with a lot of things. Can God trust you at this moment? And I do know what you're saying. I don't think God can trust me. Well, be of good cheer. Today we're going to talk about how to be led by the Spirit of God, even though you missed the mark so many times. So first of all, I want you to write it down. Meditate on the Word of God. We did this last week. Be a doer of the Word of God. So many Christians have got a good story. Oh, we do talk a good talk. But there's no action. There's nothing. I want to tell you, if you want to be a mature God, a child of God, you need to be led by the Spirit of God, and you need to be a doer of the Word of God. So many of us got this idea that the kingdom of God is only about preaching. It's about doing. It's more about doing than anything else. The next one. Put the word of God above anything else. That's why I said, if, if you come to church and there's nothing that you've not expected about anything, God says, those who come to me must believe that I am and the reward of those who seek me. Are you seeking God? Put the word of God above. It's a, just a key thing. It's not over until God says it's over. Some of us need to hear it this morning. Your life, it's not over until God says it's over. Instantly respond to your spirit. When God speaks, so many of us want to have a sign from heaven. God spoke to you. My son, my daughter, I want you to do this. God, just, just send me a sign. And then after God showed you the sign, God, just give me another sign. 
And then after that sign, God, just give me another sign and just give me another sign, just give me another sign. Why don't you just tell God in the beginning, God, I don't want to do it. Because you need to know it, instantly respond to your spirit. When God speaks to you, are you obedient or can you say, come to the place and say, God, I will move. Even if the world says it's, it's impossible, will you put your next foot on the water and say, God, I don't know how this is going to end, but God, I will I'll put your word to the test. Okay. Can I, can I ask someone to? Henry, please come here. This morning. You can need this. You can just understand right there. I'm going to preach. How do you know when God speaks? And we're going to start off this series today. Um, uh, Hebrews 5.12. For indeed, because of time, you ought to be teachers. He says, for time's sake, all of you should have been mature in Christ. You should have been teachers of the word of God. He's speaking to people like me and like you. And then he goes further and says, you have need to want, uh, uh, that one teach you again what are the first principles of the oracles of God. It, it, it's, it's almost like, like Paul is saying, the further we go in God, the further we get to religious organization and religious, the more we get religious, the more we need to start at the, pre, at the beginning again. The more we get free from all our bondage, it's, it's almost like man always tries to put himself in bondage. Man always tried to get himself bound again. So here's the thing. I've heard a message this, uh, last week. And this person said um, that they saw this video. And this video actually um, said something about the praying hands. Now this is demonic. The praying hands that people send over WhatsApp. It brings a curse on you. It's almost the, the moment we are free, we want to get something else to set us in bondage. Oh, we are walking in freedom now. God says you are blessed in the field, blessed in the city. Oh, your cupeth overfloweth. And the moment your cupeth overfloweth, and now you all of a sudden, oh no, no, you know my Toyota is bringing a curse on me. Oh, you know that Persian carpet? That's another thing. Oh, you know that praying hands? And Paul is saying, and maybe he's writing to you and he's writing to me this morning. He said, some of us should have been past this. But now we need to get back to the beginning. Now we need to get back to point A. And he goes for this say, For everyone partaking in milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is an infant, a baby. And he goes for this, But solid food belongs to those who are full of age. I, I don't know how that works because the older we get, the less teeth we have. No, I'm joking. Because maybe it's not talking about a physical man, maybe it's talking about a spiritual man. Maybe he's talking about those who are full of age. Those who God can trust with his freedom. God can trust with his liberty. God can trust him with whatever God wants. David, David was a gangster. You don't believe it? David was a gangster. Uh, go and read uh, uh, Samuel. He will read that Samuel was a... Many of us weren't even allowed to come and preach on a Sunday. Really, but every Sunday we preach on, oh, David, you were a great man. But can I tell you, he was a gangster. One of his things, except the lady that he checked out on the balcony. That's a different story. But there was a, there was a time when he said all of his gang members, guys, I'm thirsty. I want some water. But not just any water, I want water from that place. And all of his gang members said, we'll do it for you. They went and they killed a whole city. A whole city. Wipe them out. And they said, okay, here's, here's your water, David. <laughs> David took the water and poured it out and said, 
Now I'm not thirsty anymore. It's too much blood. It was shed. And I look at myself and say, God, but David is, 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 a, is a bad man. David is he's a gangster. Not a Whitbank gangster, the Cape Flats gangster. <laughs> Not the wannabes. I'm talking about the real gangsters. God, and God said something so clear. God said, David is a man after my own heart. Because I, he did exactly what I asked him to do. Which brings me to a point. That could it be that God looks past all your mistakes the moment you walk in the spirit of freedom? Could it be that, that God says you're a man and a, uh, and a woman after his own heart the moment you start to walk in what he has called you for? And you're not asking for sign after sign after sign after sign after sign after sign. God said it. I believe it. And that settles it. Because God said it. Every time we come onto this platform and say, God, you said there will be miracles and miracles will follow us. Every time I walk onto this platform, I put a demand on it. Because God said it. I believed it. And that settles it. So many times and many times, nothing happened. It's not my problem. God said it. I believed it. That settles it. Some of us need to get this in the, into our hearts. That God said something about your life. He has called you for purpose. You need to believe it. I know the thoughts that I think towards you speaks the Lord. Days of hope and a future. Rina, I'm going to ask you to come. I know it's, 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 it's a lot of people on the stage, but I love them. Before we go on, I, wa I want Rina to just share a testimony quickly. Let's give her a hand. Yeah, we only have two minutes. Hi, all of you. Okay, so pastor asked me to give my testimony in English. So just bear with me, please. <laughs> As most of you know, I came from the background as a Jehovah's Witness. And because of things that my ex-husband done, and I put my signature on a divorce order, I was disfellowshipped out of the religion. So my whole family is Jehovah's Witnesses, and they're no longer allowed to talk to me because I'm now better or worse than an unbeliever, according to them. But luckily, God feels different. <laughs> so, um, this means that my family can, cannot contact or have contact with me. I want you to keep this in mind when I tell you the rest of my testimony. I got divorced seven years ago. Um, and because of what happened and this man didn't keep his agreement, as a result of that, um, and not paying what was agreed to, I also fall behind of some of the staff at once the bank even want to come and fetch my car because he stopped paying my car that was part of the agreement. So in January, he just sent me an SMS and told me, um, Rina, I can't pay your car, no Andre school fees, and I also can't pay her maintenance. I already went and bought Andre a new school clothes and things that she needed. And of course, I was wondering and I, th I thought, how will I be able to make it? I said to him, okay, just keep me um, um, in mind uh, um, if you get work or so. So he didn't come back to me. And like four weeks ago, of course, I keep how much he owed me every month, put it in a little budget saying, okay, Every month I just add it, add it. And of course, it's not a nice thing. And it's like the enemy wants to remind you of something and take your peace away. And four weeks ago, I wrote him a message at work the Monday. I said to him, Andres, did you um, got any work? And he said to me, um, Rina, I'm so sorry. I only um, have work twice a week in a workshop. I cannot pay even my rent. I pay only half of it, and I can hardly buy food. 
And at that moment, God talked clearly to me, and he said to me, write him a message, paid in full. And I didn't think about it. I just done it immediately. And I felt the biggest peace coming over me. Now I don't need to worry about money owing me anymore. Um, I can only tell you guys that this money could have meant a lot to us because we're moving into our own home um, the end of the month. Um, that passed the pride for us. <laughs> and we need to change the carpets and stuff, but I trusted God. And you won't believe it, God didn't left me there. He challenged me that night even further. He woke me up at night and he said to me, you need to pay Andres a thousand rand the next morning. <laughs> so the next morning, I write him a message again. I said to him, listen, are you still with the same bank that you were seven years ago? And he said to me, yes, but why? I said, because God told me to pay you a thousand rand. And he said to me, Rina, please don't pay the money into my bank account. Because of bank fees, I will hardly receive any of that. I said, okay, I will e-wallet it for you. So I done it, and I feel complete peace, and I was so happy. And I even told Pastor when I came for a course this Saturday morning of what happened. I didn't know what the future will have in store. So last week and Thursday, Pastor start with hearing God's voice clearly. So I was so at peace because I knew I heard God's voice clearly because there was no agitating or anything. So that evening, we had load shedding, four hours. So me and Henri went for a power nap on my bed. So later, in the dark, I hear a missed call. And I got up, check who it was. And just as I wanted to say, did you look for me? And please keep in mind of what I said in the beginning, that my family is Jehovah's Witnesses and not allowed to contact me. There was my late sister's husband sending me a message. Rina, you a beneficiary on Magda's pension fund. You need to send me your bank details. So the next day I went to the bank because I needed to get a letter from the bank, not older than three months. So I went to the bank, get it, send it to him. And he said to me, I just want to inform you, the money will be paid out the end of July. I said, thank you very much. I didn't ask how much, nothing, because I just trust in God. If God wants to bless me with money, he will know exactly how much it is. And because it's also the time that we are moving into our new house. So, yeah, I just wanted to share with you. Amen. So this morning we're going to continue on how to hear the voice of God, how to be led by the Spirit of God. But first of all, I want to say, and, and, and I'm, I'm thankful that Henry is, is here, um, dear we need to know that we all have a GPS. Each one of us has got a GPS built inside of us. Some of us call it our sixth sense. Some of us call it our sixth sense, and some of us call it that's that, that voice. Oh, I, just, I don't know what it, what it was, just that voice. Some of us call it the Spirit of God. So... Here's the thing. We need to understand, first of all, we are all, we all have a GPS that is leading us somewhere. Each and every one of us has got a GPS. That GPS, write it in your notes, that GPS is called peace. Peace is always our GPS. But the moment the peace leaves, you need to know that the moment peace leaves, it's not of God. So how to know, how to distinguish between your voice, the devil's voice, and the voice of God? Because we all need to know where we're leading. Because some of us, and not all of us, don't know where the end point is. So we need to trust God to say, God, I don't know where the end is. That's why I need a GPS. That's why I need to be led by the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God always will lead you to a place where he wants you to be. So your GPS is called peace. 
So you know when peace leaves, the falling will happen. The moment it's not of God, this will happen. You'll lose your peace. If you lose your peace, don't do it. Guys, I want you to write this down. This is one of the, one of the key things that Rina just said. The moment when God speaks and there's peace, that's why I said peace above everything else. Peace in the midst of your storm. The peace that will surpass us all understanding. What does that mean? That means the following. I am being led by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God says, I want you to give in a time and a season where you are right now. The world says, how can you do that? It's impossible. Listen here. In her situation, in her situation, God says, I want you to write all the debt. I want you to write it off. The world will say, are you crazy? Are you mad? What is wrong with this woman? Don't you know that you're going to move into your new place? Don't you know you're going to need that money? Who's going to pay for that car? Who's going to pay for that new carpet? You need that money, grind him. Get the law. Even if you get a thousand out of him, it's still better than nothing. Okay. So peace is in the midst of your storm. In the midst of what you're facing. The peace that will surpass all understanding. Understanding says the following. Grind him. Get it out of him. And the peace says, no, no, no. Write it off. I, I don't know why I've got, I've got this. I've got this peace inside of me. I don't know why, because I need that money. I need, I need that. And God says, peace will be your GPS. Peace will lead you. The moment you lose your peace, stop. Don't do it. It will, it will really help you in a lot of bad, bad situations. If peace, leave, don't do it. If there's confusion, don't do it. Where the Spirit of God is, there's no confusion. I, I, I did not say she knew exactly where she needed to go, but there was no confusion. When God spoke, when God spoke, she knew exactly what to do. I don't say she knew how the end result would look like, but she knew exactly what to do because there's no confusion in God. How to be led by the Spirit of God, there's no confusion. There's not, you will know. That's why I say, some of us say, God, just give me another sign. Just give me another sign. Just give me another sign. God, if, the, if all the sheep will have black spots, no, no, no. God, if the zebra, if it's a black zebra with white stripes, I'm in. And when God shows you a white zebra with black stripes, you say, no, no, God, that looks like a black zebra with white stripes. Some of us don't want to hear. Some of us don't want to be led. There's no confusion when God speaks. The next one we need to go through quickly. If fear is in your heart, don't do it. If there's fear involved, uh, 1 John 4, 18 says, and perfect love casts out all fear. If there's fear, I don't know. I don't know if I should do it. Um, stop. It is not of God. If there's any fear involved, stop. Pray about it. Get the Get the right answer for your situation. Because now you're led. And the thing is, God is asking you to bring maturity in your life. God wants to see, can I trust you? The world says the following, time is running out for you. You need to make this quick. Move in quickly, young men, young women. Move in quickly. Remember, time is against you. Marry her quickly. Marry him quickly. Time is running out. I need to get the next best thing. I need to marry quickly. Because the world will always tell you, you need to move quickly. And the next one is, if it's short-lived, and I know this is one of the things that we struggle with, everything about God is never short-lived. I get people that come to me and say, Pastor, God said, I must follow you. This is my church home, and I will serve in this house, and I will die for this house. Two weeks later, God said, I must move on. God says, this is not my house. The, uh, the house next door, that's my, that's my new house. Can I tell you something? Everything about God is, is long-lived. It's never, ever short-lived. Uh, 
whenever God speaks, He never ever have this situation in, in, uh, in, 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 in mind. He says Jesus was crucified before the foundations of the earth, but He was made known so that me and you could believe. But when did it start to happen in God's mind? Before the foundations of the earth. He says, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Everything about me is generational. He says, I want you to have enough for your children's children. I want you, if you grasp my principles, you need to know this, that God wants you to have enough for your children's children. It means that grandpas is a blessing to their grandchildren. Everything about God is never, ever short-lived. Think about everything that was short-lived in your life and ask yourself, was God in it? Get rich quick. Lotto. <laughs> Let's talk about the lotto quickly. Um, that number, if I can only get that number. If I can, if just God, just speak to me so that I get that number. Because all my happiness is locked up in that six numbers or seven. I can't even remember how many numbers. All my happiness, everything that I could be, is locked up in six numbers. And when you get it, stats says the following. Two years afterwards, you're worse. You're even more poor after you want it. What does it mean? It means that God has got generational wealth inside of you. God wants to speak to you about, and have, well, listen here, wealth is, money is the least of your problems. God has called you to break the cycles of generational curses over your life. All of your family was this. All of your family was this. All of your family. God says, I've called you because you're a, I'm a generational God. He says, I will bless you in your thousand generations. Everything about God is generational. And we all want to have everything short-lived. The only the, the enemy is short-lived. He's not an eternal being. Because you will find him in hell. But you are an eternal being. Everything about you, even the decisions that you make today, God, I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. God says, I will use that to change your generations. I will use that to change whatever was behind you. I will change that and I will see that your children will serve me because you served me. Everything about God is generational. It's never short-lived. So many times when people say, Oh, Pastor, you know, this is my house. You know, I've, uh, I, I, I love it. I'll die for this house. Yeah. Short-lived dreams. Because I see it so many times. Maybe you did not hear the voice of God. One of the um, commandments in, in, in the is it in Exodus, Exodus 20. It says, do not use God's name in vain. Is it? It's one of the commandments. It's only 10. You don't have to worry. It's only 10. One of them is, don't use God's name in vain. And many of you think it's because they use God's name in a, in a movie. Can, you tell, can I tell you what brings more destruction? God said, this is my house, and this is where I will die, in, and this is it. And two weeks later, God said, this is it, and this is it. Oh, God said, you are my wife. God said, you are my husband. God said, you are. Two weeks later. Oh, God has changed his mind again. Oh, no, this is my wife. This is my husband. This is it. And two weeks later. Don't use God's name in vain. Don't use God's name to excuse yourself from your poor decisions. I'm going to say, I said I'm going to be straight. Please come back for next week. I'm not here for your happiness. I'm here for your joy. I'm here to see you celebrate the life of Christ after this. The more I die, the more God can live. Okay, so, okay, okay. It doesn't produce a blessing. I'm almost done. It doesn't produce a blessing. Wherever God is, there's blessings. 
It's not confirmed by other people. See people? Jesus was written, written himself in the, in the history books 2,000 years ago, God himself. But you see, Jesus couldn't just walk around and say, I'm the son of God. Don't worry, I am the son of God. You see, it needed to be confirmed by two or more people. That's why he said, with two or more who come in my name, there I am. And he says, with two or more people come together, that's church. So by the witness of two or more people, that, then that's established. Okay. So Jesus written himself into the history books of mankind 2,000 years ago. It was more, but it's 2,000 years ago. So he had a guy, his name was uh, John the Baptist. John the Baptist was uh, known for baptizing people and preparing the way for the Lord. Remember? He, he, he had only one job, one job. He was weird, ate locust, wild honey, weird belt, everything. He was a weird guy. But he was the highest authority in that time. So when Jesus showed up to the, on, on the scene, he said, I need to establish my calling and establish what God has called me for by two or more. I went to the Jordan River. John the Baptist saw him and said, Jesus, please stop there. I'm not worth it to tie even your sandals. And Jesus said, no, 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 stop, John, you're missing out. This is so that the will of God can be fulfilled because it needs to be confirmed by two or more people. Okay. Jesus got into the water, comes out of the water. John was baptizing him. The next moment, there was a voice from heaven. An audible voice so that other people can hear it because, it because it needs to be confirmed. And what did they say? This is my beloved son in who I am well pleased. By the confirmation of two or more. That's where a covenant is started. So we need to understand that this, it will always be confirmed by two or more people. That's why I say it's good for you to get to your life group. It's good for you to come and pray about it. If you don't have clarity, stop. Get someone to pray with you. And by the confirmation of two people, it is established. That's why it's good for the, the voice of, of the prophetic to be in the house. So the moment there's a prophetic voice in the house, please come and pray with me. This is what I need to do. And God says, it's not the time now. That brings maturity when you say, okay, I, can, I will agree with the yes and with the no. But many of us only want to uh, 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 react on the yes. Oh, God said it. Do you say that I am not called? Do you say I, uh, I haven't listened well? No, no, it just needs to be confirmed. Because the anointing, ah, uh, listen here. Okay. So there was a man named David. David was uh, the king of Israel. There was a time when, when Samuel came and he came and anointed him. The moment he anointed him, it was Samuel and the oil because he was anointed with oil. The oil speaks of a person. It was the Holy Spirit. He was anointed for that. So Samuel came and he says, okay, I'm going to confirm it. God spoke it, but this is how it's going to work. I need to confirm it by two or more. The prophet and the oil. The prophet and the Holy Spirit. It wasn't just the Holy Spirit. It wasn't just your voice that you hear. Oh, I hear the voice of God. Do you want to tell me I don't hear the voice? Now we want to say you do hear the voice of God. But sometimes our season is out. Sometimes our maturity is not worth it. Sometimes our character is not worth it. So we need to understand that sometimes it's good to hear a no from someone. Because the moment you only hear yes, 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 then you miss God. You miss your season. You miss your season of maturity. And we need to understand, to, get, to reach maturity in Christ, sometimes it's good to listen to a no. This is not now, this is not the time, it's not the season. Just wait. I want to go, I want to run with it. That's good, just wait. We know that you are called, but there needs to be another confirmation. 
And now I should do this. Now there needs to be confirmation. That's when we marry people. We always ask them, what does your parents say? Why? Because there needs to be confirmation. There needs to be a blessing. You need to know, it needs to be confirmed by another person. And it's never hasty. People try to convince you. We need to go quickly. We need to go quickly. We need to go. Don't, don't worry. We, we need to go. Uh, uh, we, uh. God is never in a hurry. God has got only two gears, slow and very slow. Two gears. God's car is like an old Ford. Only two gears. Slow and very slow. And there's oil. No, I'm joking. Don't worry. That was just a... God is never in a hurry. Everything that God does, everything that He does, He takes time. The world tries to convince you and say, you need to be quick. Time is running out. Make the decision. I remember all, all of these, because that's the, the tactic. And, and if you're working for a call center, forgive me for this. That's why they ask in a call center, you need to make a decision now. Because they know when you go and sit and think about it, you will say, this is not a good idea. And God says, this is how the world is thinking of. I have come to bring no condemnation. I have come to bring freedom. Can I get one more person? Yaku, please go. The word says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So the enemy tries to bring you under a spirit of bondage. God says, there is now no condemnation. But many of us have misquoted the scripture because God actually said there's no condemnation for those who are in, in Christ Jesus. It means that you need to be led by the Spirit of God. Otherwise, there will be condemnation. Otherwise, there will be a place where you always feel condemned. There will be a place. Because then it goes on and says, those who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Because where the Spirit of God is, there is freedom. And where the Spirit of God is, there is life. He says, some of us, some of us need to understand this, that God is generational. First of all, God says there's no, no, no condemnation for those who are, just stand there quickly, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If there's condemnation, God says, I'm not in it. Not because you're a good guy, not because you're a good woman, but there is no, no, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for those who walk not according to the flesh. What does the world say? The world says, everything that I said, the opposite of that. There is no peace. Just make the decision quickly. The world says the following, that you need to grind him. The world says, man, it needs to make sense. I will believe the moment I see. God says the moment you will see, <laughs> you will not believe. But the moment you believe, you will start seeing things. I've seen so many times that people say, I will only, if I only see, I want to see God. And I say, just open your eyes. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for those who are not walking according to the flesh. The flesh always wants to know what's the end product. Where am I heading? What is the end? What is the outcome? God, like I just said now, God, if I only get that six numbers, if I can only get that, if I can only, get, if I can only marry that guy, if I can only marry that woman, if I can only, I want to know where this is. Many of us, exactly here. This is a worldly and a fleshly way. I need to know, and then I will do. I will know, I want to know, and only then I will do. He says, but those are the people that's walking according to the flesh. 
What are you after? But you see, the Spirit of God says the following, that He's only asking you for one step, and then one step, and then one step, and then one step, and then one step. Uh, but uh, Andres, I don't know where I'm going. It's okay. You're leading, you're, you're led by the Spirit of God. You're led by the will of God. You're led by, and God says, okay, okay, Yaku, because you have chosen to follow me, your generation after you will start to follow me. Uh, uh, but but Andres, I don't know how it's going to look like. Paul, Peter, God said to, to, to Peter, Peter, I want you to get out of the boat. Peter said, is it you? I will get out. She said, it is me. Peter had to step out. And God had to find him in the middle. There's a place, and I want everybody to stand quickly. There's two scriptures. My time is up. There's two scriptures. Romans 8.28 says, I will make everything work out for the better for those who are, who loves me. He says that even when you misplace your step somewhere, maybe you've missed the mark in, in your life, maybe you've missed it completely. Maybe you had to turn back and start from point A. And maybe this morning it is a time where you came to a place and say, Andres, I've missed the mark so far. I've missed it. My GPS, there's no more peace. There's no more joy. There's nothing. But then God says, I will make everything work out for the better. For those who love me, it's not for everybody. You see, some of us have missed the mark so far. We don't even know what it is to be led by the Spirit of God. And then Jeremiah 29, 11, 12, 13, and 14. I want to read it and then we are finished. It says, for I am conscious of the thoughts about you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a hope at the end. It means that even though I don't see the end anymore, it actually says that because I am in Christ and because I'm being led by the Spirit of God, it means that I don't know what the next step is. I don't know what the outcome is, but I do know that I need to move. I need to take the next step. I need to take the next step. And, and he goes on and says this. He says in, in verse 12, and you will go on crying to me and make prayer to me, and I will give ear to you. He says, I will start to hear your prayers. And you will be searching for me, and I will be there. When you have gone after me with all your heart, you do not walk according to the flesh anymore. In verse 14, and I will be near you and your fate, your outcome will change. He says that even though this is what the enemy tried for you, he wanted to see that outcome. God says, your outcome is hidden in me. And the only way you will find out what your outcome is, is when you start to look for me. And the moment you start to look for me, you will be led by me. You will be led by the Spirit and not by sight, but you will be led by faith. And God says, your outcome is hidden in me. It means the more I seek Him, the more I will find out what my purpose and my fate is. It means that the, if you, even though the enemy said to you that you are worth nothing, God says, your fate and your outcome is hidden in me. 
It means that I hold your future in my hand. Romans 8.28 says, even though you miss the mark, your future is hidden in me. Even though everything was against her, God says, don't worry, I've got the outcome in my hand. Even though you're facing what you're facing at this moment, God says, don't worry, I've got the outcome in my hand. And I know for some of us, it's the weirdest thing to put your faith and your outcome in a person that you don't even see. But can I urge you on? He says, I will make everything work out for the better for those who love me. Some of us need to start to love him again. We need to get to a place and say, God, I've tried to see my outcome this way. The moment your outcome is not in God, that's where disappointment starts. Because you said you should have been there. You should have been there a long time ago. And now, I just look at me now. But God says your outcome is in my hand. I'm the author and the finisher of your faith. It means that everything that you can be, and everything that you're going to be will be in his, in his hands. Not because of what I said, but because you love him. So with every eyes closed, every eye closed. Father, as we come to the end of the service. Father, I ask that you come in this moment and in this time. Father, you come and you speak to people's lives and people's hearts this morning. Father, for us to reach maturity in you, we first need to be connected to you. And Father, this morning, prophetically, we want to give everything that I can be and everything I want to be, Father. We want to give it back into your hands. And Father, I ask that you come and change people's outcomes today. In Jesus' name. Come and change them. From this moment. In Jesus' name. Amen.